So hi, everyone. Thanks for coming this week to another installment of the IGS Global Seminar Series. This week, we are very excited to have Dr. Melinda Webster from the University of Washington. Um, this past year, Melinda published a really cool paper on geoengineering of Arctic sea ice. And the idea was to brighten Arctic sea ice and to try to use this as a way to, to limit some of the melt of Arctic sea ice. Um, I really, really enjoyed the paper. I would encourage everyone to go check it out if you haven't already. And Melinda was kind enough to agree to give a presentation on the topic in the seminar series. So thank you for joining this week. And without further ado, I will pass it over to Melinda. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to present today. And um, I'm just going to share my screen. Let's make sure that this works before I get started. And I also want to thank my co-author, Steve Warren, because this is really his idea to pursue this topic and roped me into this analysis. And it's been a pretty fun journey throughout the process. Um, OK, so the topic of today is geoengineering to brighten Arctic sea ice. Um, there's a lot of geoengineering ideas out there. And just to give you a primer of what geoengineering is, uh, the idea, sorry, yeah, just to give you an idea of what today's talk is about, it's not about stratospheric aerosol injection and it's not about marine cloud brightening. These are two um, methods that have been proposed to do solar radiation management. We're taking a look at what is being done to the sea ice, to the Arctic sea ice specifically, and a more localized method or a local application of solar geoengineering. Now there are two, I guess you could say, categories of how geoengineering could work for Arctic sea ice. And one is to increase the growth rate of Arctic sea ice in winter, and the other category is to reduce the melt of Arctic sea ice in summer. So to visit this first category, um, this is increasing the ice growth rate. The problem is that it's hard to grow sea ice when it is warm, um, because that latent heat of freezing needs to be conducted upward through the sea ice. And as ice thickens, it's harder for that heat to go through to the surface of the ice. So the solution for some of this has been, to, or several solutions have been proposed, but one solution is pumping or spraying seawater on the sea ice surface to help it freeze. And this was nicely summarized in a paper by Desch et al. in 2017. And there's been a lot of work on this since that 2017 analysis. And I'd encourage you all to check out these papers if you're interested in this topic. Um, but that's pretty much all I want to say about this category of geoengineering Arctic sea ice. Now, the one that Steve and I were interested in is reducing the melt rate of Arctic sea ice in summer. And specifically by spreading glass powder on the sea ice cover in a, an intent with the intent of increasing its surface albedo. Um, so our involvement kind of had an interesting trajectory. It really started out with this geoengineering modeling research consortium where uh, there were many people giving interesting talks. Uh, specifically, Leslie Field gave a presentation on this idea of spreading the glass powder on Arctic sea ice to raise its albedo, which would make it more reflective, reduce the sea ice melt, and uh, would help maintain older, thicker sea ice in the Arctic. And this is the one that we're scrutinizing because it's had a lot of work done into it. Uh, they had a laboratory experiment, they had field experiments, and they have substantial funding and substantial publicity. So we're, interesting, we're interested in looking at this a bit further and applying it to sea ice data that we have. Now to back up for a second, I wanted to give some examples or to explain a bit further about what this glass powder actually is. Um, there's a summary of this in the 2018 study led by Leslie Field and others. And I do want to note that this group used to be called ICE 911. It is now the Arctic Ice Project. So we're interested in knowing what effects this glass powder had. So here, now you can see my little pointer, what this glass powder had on the reflectivity of the Arctic sea ice surface. Now this glass powder, um, it, these are hollow glass microspheres, and I'll be referring to them as HGMs probably quite frequently throughout this talk. HGMs is the hollow glass microsphere. And what this powder is, it's 
a um, sphere of glass, but it's hollow on the inside. And it has a very thin glass wall and it's made up of sodium lime borosilicate glass. Um, so some people would say that this is safe for the environment because it's made up of silica, but as you'll see, there are some questions about that environmental impact. Now, you've probably encountered this HGM material at some point in your life. Um, it has many applications in the industry. If you've gone bowling, maybe the bowling ball you used was made up with uh, a mixture of these HGMs. If you've ever had to repair a hole in your walls or ceilings, the spackle that's used to repair that is often made of HGMs and other composites. Um, it's in maybe in less uh, everyday applications, uh, it's also used for these emulsion explosives. So what explosives, which I thought was kind of interesting. And then one thing that my dad pointed out to me was that they also use it as casing for these drill wells for oil companies. Um, so it gets pumped around these uh, drilling pipes, which I thought was interesting. So it has a wide use in industries and there are safety uh, recommendations for using these HGMs. And I have some of those listed here. So from the manufacturer, and this is specific to the 3M, um, that's the name of the company and the material is the K1. Uh, what they say is that it is not great to breathe, so avoid breathing the dust of these HGMs and do not eat, drink, or smoke when using this product. And definitely wash your hands afterwards. And they do say avoid releasing to the environment. And if there are breakages that occur with those hollow glass microspheres, they do uh, release a sulfur oxide, which can be uh, hazardous. Now, when I've presented this work before, a lot of times people will ask me what in the environmental impact is and I'll share what little I know and what little many people know about the environmental impact of this substance. Um, what I found is based on the 2018 study by Leslie Field and others and this is in their supplementary information is they exposed these um, sheep's head minnows that's what is shown here on the lower right to these HGMs for 96 hours and there was a 100% survival rate. And as another test, they had northern bobwhites, this bird right here, uh, ingest an amount of these hollow glass microspheres and they had no signs of toxicity, which they define as at least 50% of the group dying. So I don't think these are really good metrics for knowing if it's a safe, um, product to apply in the polar marine habitat and field it all and others do acknowledge that there needs to be more work done in understanding what the true environmental impact is. And I would just echo that point again. We know very little about what its true impact is. And there is reason to believe that the silica in these HGMs would in fact have an impact on phytoplankton productivity. Okay, so now let's get back to the study and what Steve and I were really interested in in assessing its, um, its usefulness for the Arctic sea ice environment. And diving into the field at all study a bit more, they had three components to their analysis. They had a laboratory uh, component, which here is showing the radiative properties of the HGM, so I'll get into details about that shortly. They also had a field component where they um, applied these HGMs on a frozen surface in this lake in Minnesota. They also had a climate modeling component. And I don't speak to this, but if you do want to chat about that after the talk, please ask a question. I do have thoughts on it. So for the laboratory component, uh, what was shown here in this image, uh, they tested this on these HGMs on a frozen pond in Lake Elmo, Minnesota. And uh, I thought this was really interesting because when I saw this image, and when Steve showed me this image, I immediately thought that's not what sea ice looks like. <laughs> this is much darker than what sea ice looks like. And it's also um, dirtier. You know, there's a lot of sediment in this water. And I'm wondering like how these albedo changes that they're measuring can be applied to the sea ice environment in a representative way. Now, for many of you have been on sea ice, you know that it's an extremely heterogeneous surface and depending on 
where you are on Arctic sea ice and what time of year you're there, you can get an incredibly big range or a different value in a surface albedo. Um, the conditions change quite rapidly and also spatially. So we were curious about applying some of the results that the field et al. study had for their optical properties of the HGNs and applying that to the sea ice environment based on data that we have of albedo measurements and also satellite observations of the different spatial coverage of these different surface types that are shown here. So to revisit the study, what exactly do we need? Um, so now I'm going to kind of gloss through some of the methods here. If you want more details, you can ask afterwards, or you can read the paper here. Um, we're happy to take any questions that you may have. So just to briefly walk through this, what do we need if we want to reevaluate this analysis for a sea ice environment? Well, we need to know what our representative surface types for Arctic sea ice, and we broke this down into eight common types that are found on Arctic sea ice. We need to know the albedo of those surface types and the monthly aerial coverage of those surface types. We also need to know the radiative properties of these HGMs, which fortunately field and all at all provide in their study. Um, so we have that information. We also need to know what's going on in the atmosphere in terms of the cloud cover and the solar flux. So we're using climatologies for that that are based on observations. And then lastly, we apply this very simple radiative transfer model to see what the albedo effect would be on the radiative forcing over Arctic sea ice. Okay, so for our eight uh, representative surface types, we broke it down into these categories. We have thick cold snow on thick sea ice. We have NELAs with no snow cover, NELAs with a little bit of snow cover, and so forth. And these are surfaces that are commonly found on Arctic sea ice. And many of these have been measured either in situ on field campaigns and or measured by satellite retrievals. So we have a good sense of what their aerial coverages are and also the uncertainties within those aerial coverages. We also have um, really nice information about their spectral albedo um, that played into our decision of how to characterize these surface conditions. So in this example, I'm showing uh, just some of the messiness of our spectral albedo measurements as a function of wavelength here. And an example being the blue is melt ponds and the red, the dark red is what's bare sea ice albedo. And we have lots and lots of these measurements from all sorts of field campaigns from the 1997 to 1998 Sheba campaign to the uh, more recent Mosaic campaign and many others. And what we did is we compiled these, well, we quality checked them and then we compiled them into our representative surface types. And that's what's shown here. This is a spectral albedo, again, for these different surfaces. So leads in open water, as you can expect, have a very low albedo. Meanwhile, thick cold snow has a very high albedo. And we broke these spectral albedos into, um, or we didn't break them down. We uh, calculated what the broadband albedo would be based on cloudy and clear sky conditions using those spectral albedos. So that's what's shown here on this uh, column, these last two columns here, the clear broadband albedo and the cloudy sky broadband albedo as a function of season on the left and the surface type. And the winner is uh, thick snow, thick cold snow in spring has the highest albedo. And um, I guess you can probably see that nylas that have no snow are some of the darkest surfaces in the Arctic. But there is certainly a seasonal component to when these surface conditions are present. That's something that we'll come back to throughout this talk. Now, for estimating the monthly coverage of these different surface conditions, we did have to use a combination of satellite retrievals and what we know from field campaigns. And there's certainly a, a change in what condition or what surface type is present at any given point in the year. So we had to generalize this a bit. We had to say, oh yeah, there are melt ponds in the summer melt season, but in reality, there might be some variability if you were to look at a local scale. But we estimated this as monthly coverage to the best of our abilities. <laughs> 
Now, I know these are a lot of numbers to throw at you. So I think the big thing I want to show here is what the most dominant ice types or surface types were on the Arctic sea ice cover. And because that has major implications for interpreting our results. And the first one is thick cold snow on thick sea ice. This had some of the uh, most widespread coverage on Arctic sea ice for an entire year. Also thick melting snow on thick sea ice. And then of course, melting sea ice with no snow. And then thin cold snow on thick sea ice. So these were the big players in our analysis. And to give you an idea of their albedos, they're really quite reflective. Um, they're point, uh, 0.74 or ranging from 0.74 to 0.87. But then of course, the melting sea ice with no snow cover has a bit of a lower albedo, which is also important. Okay, so we've characterized what the surface conditions are and the aerial coverages, or the aerial coverage of them. Now we need to pull in some information about the HGM radiative properties. And so I showed this before, but I want to walk you through it now. This is from the 2018 paper where they show that albedo has a function of wavelength. This is the structural albedo again. But this is as a function or the different colors represent a different thickness of HGM. So uh, the 331 micron is the thickest layer of HGMs. I'm exaggerating here, it's not this big, but it's the thickest layer that we evaluate compared to these thinner layers that they measured. So we wanted to go with the um, more extreme or the thickest layer for our analysis to really see what its impact would be. So this. 331 uh, micrometer uh, layer here, which is slightly uh, above 0.4 spectral albedo for nearly all wavelengths. Now, what was really nice about this 2018 paper is they also mes measured the transmittance through these layers. You can see that uh, there is light that is transmitted through. Again, it's about above 0.4, nearly 0.5 for many wavelengths for this 331 micron layer. Now, what's nice about albedo and transmittance, if you have those two pieces of information, you can get the absorptance because light can only do one of three things, right? It can be reflected, it can be absorbed or transmitted. And if you know the albedo and the transmittance, you can back out what the absorption is. And that's what we did. So we have of all the information we need to run our radiative transfer model. Um, and to show you how we did this, um, these blue lines, so the dark blue is the, transmit, the spectral transmittance that was provided by the 2018 paper. The light blue line is reflectance provided by that paper. And then what we calculated for absorption is this red line. So it's one minus these two. Uh, there are some vertical dashed lines on this, as you'll see. Uh, the way we characterized visible band and near infrared band albedos is split by this dashed vertical line. And this other one at the 1.5 um, level here, that is representing what the instrument, um, uh, where the instrument that field at all used, it didn't measure any wavelengths longer than that. So we made an assumption that these were just constant, which is not a bad assumption because these are the lower energy range of the wavelengths. All right. So this is uh, getting through our list of representative surface types, the radiative properties of HGNs. Now I want to uh, go through the cloud climatology briefly and the solar flux data that we use. And then I will also walk through the simple two-layer radiative transfer model. Now for the cloud climatology, these are based on observations. And we made a, a very simple assumption that 80% of the time, and 80% of the area is covered by clouds for 70 to 90 degrees north. And there is some variation that we apply to our calculations, but for the most part, it's 80% cloud cover. So when I was showing those differences of the clear sky and cloudy sky albedos, when we take both of those into account, it's really weighted more heavily towards the cloudy sky albedos for the Arctic since it's such a cloudy place. For the solar fluxes, um, this is again a climatology. This is provided in Dennis Hartman's book from 2016. And I think the big takeaway here, and I know many of you already know this, but in polar environments, it's dark in the winter time. 
it's fairly dark in the shoulder season time. And then during the summer is really when we have a lot of insulation reaching the surface and at the top of the atmosphere. So thinking again about the seasonality of these different surface conditions plays into the seasonality of sunlight as well. Okay, now we're getting to the uh, simple two-layer radiative transfer model. And I think this is a really nice exercise um, for me in understanding how to simplify what happens to light when you add a layer on top of a surface. So that's what's being represented here, this layer, this light gray thing, and the surface down here. This model is, um, is a way to calculate what happens to the solar flux as it's scattered between these two surfaces. So you have sunlight coming down and it reaches a surface, but as it goes through this layer, some of it gets backscattered down towards the surface and some of it gets transmitted through and so on and so on and so on. And this can be elegantly summarized by this equation where G represents the layer and I represents the surface. So we're applying this model to the sea ice environment based on the radiative, uh, or the radiative properties of the HGMs and the albedos of the sea ice surface. So we wanted to do a conceptual analysis of how does this apply to a surface that has a range of albedo from zero to one, what would happen? And that's what this figure is showing. So this is what we call the system albedo. The system albedo is that layer on top of an underlying surface. And the underlying albedo, the albedo of the underlying surface is represented on this x-axis. And this is just for um, the 500 nanometer wavelength. So this is just taking one point within that visible spectrum. And so as you start from, a, you could say a black surface at zero going to a, an extremely bright surface of one, uh, that's what you get with this underlying albedo, this black line shown here. Now, when you add a layer of these HGMs on top, and I should say that we're using that thickest layer of HGMs, if you add those on top, that's what this red line represents, you do raise the albedo substantially for surfaces that are darker than 0.61. So the albedo increases quite a bit. But beyond 0.61, so if you have a surface that's more reflective than 0.61, you actually darken the surface albedo. The system albedo decreases. And I think that's uh, an indicator that there's something going on here, that there might be a limit to what these HGMs can do. So then we sat back and thought, well, what happens if you add a whole bunch of these thick layers of HGMs? Then what happens to the albedo then? And that's what we did in this calculation here. So we have the system albedo on the left. And on the bottom, uh, this is showing the number of those layers that are applied. And if you start out with a completely dark surface, an albedo of zero, no matter how many layers you apply, you eventually reach a plateau of 0.61. At, um, and if you were to do this with a completely reflective surface, you actually decrease the albedo with each layer applied, but eventually you plateau at an al system albedo of 0.61. So this is consistent with the previous result in that you can't really boost the albedo for anything uh, with, by adding a lot more of these HGMs that just flattens out and it has no effect uh, after a while. But if you were to add one layer, which is what's being proposed here, you can have a dramatic effect on the albedo if it's a very reflective surface versus if it's, or it can um, raise the albedo if it's a very dark surface. Now these are conceptual results. What if we have now apply this radiative transfer model to the surface conditions on Arctic sea ice. So this is what we're doing. And what I'm about to show you is the monthly radiative forcing that results um, by applying these HGMs as a function of surface type and month. So on the left-hand side is the top of the atmosphere radiative forcing, and on the right-hand side is the surface radiative forcing, and the colors denote the different surface types. So the big things to point out here is what's happening during the springtime. So the yellow is cold, thick snow on sea ice, and it's sea ice with thick, melting snow. These are actually darkening quite a bit. A positive value means the surface is darker and absorbing 
more sunlight. Um, and there's a big effect that happens when you apply HGMs there. Uh, but if you look at the negative radiative forcing that results from these applications, there are some that occur with NELAs with no snow. So these were dark surfaces in the springtime and in the autumn. There's also NELAs with cold thin snow that are affected by these HGMs, meaning that it does uh, reduce the radiative forcing because of the increase in albedo. But then there's melt ponds, which I want to take a moment to discuss how this is an interesting result because melt ponds probably have a negligible effect due to the effects of wind and the clumping of the HGMs. And there was a really cool uh, art exhibit I saw a couple of years ago showing this exact phenomenon. Uh, this is in Bentonville, Arkansas. And what you see are these reflective spheres on this pond, right? Well, the wind was coming from this direction and blowing the spheres into this edge here. And so these spheres move around with the wind and so do the HGMs, they get blown around by the wind. And this is something that was encountered in the Minnesota experiment where they had clumping on the edges of the pond because of wind. And I know many of you have done field work on Arctic sea ice mass, you'll know it's a very windy place and melt ponds are no exception. They do get affected by the wind in the Arctic. So there's pretty strong reason to believe that these HGMs would not remain uniformly covered on these melt ponds and they would get blown to this slide and clump. So the radiative effect would actually be quite small. There's also this element of melt ponds not being fully contained. They have lateral drainage channels and many of these do drain into leads. Um, so HGMs would likely also be uh, being removed from melt ponds through these lateral drainage channels into the open water environment. So for this reason, we neglect, or we don't neglect, we exclude the impact of HGMs on melt ponds in our calculations because it would be infeasible for them to stay uniformly covered on the CI or on the melt pond surface. So looking at these different surface types and these monthly differences, what is the net effect? So it, it, does it have a net positive or net negative effect on the radiative forcing over Arctic sea ice? And that's what we're showing here. The biggest effect is that the radiative forcing increases. This is primarily driven by those high albedo surfaces that are present in the springtime. And that's when the sunlight is really starting to kick in. And uh, this, is, this dominates the net effect over the whole season or over the whole year. Um, the negative radiative forcing that results in these shoulder seasons is so small that it really doesn't contribute much to the net annual effect. The net annual average of the radiative forcing is an increase of 3.3 watts per meter square over the Arctic Ocean, which is significant. And that's a 3.5 watts per meter square increase in radiative forcing at the top of the atmosphere over the Arctic Ocean. So our key takeaway from the study is that this proposal of using HGMs to save Arctic sea ice actually has the opposite effect of what's intended. Spreading HGMs on the Arctic sea ice would actually warm the Arctic climate and speed Arctic sea ice loss. Now, if we wanted to try to give this the benefit of a doubt. Um, the real key thing in our result is that these HGMs are slightly absorptive. So I talked about albedo, transmittance, and absorp uh, the absorption of these HGMs. The absorption is driving these results. So what if there could be an HGM that was manufactured that is totally non-absorbing? What would the results be? And that's what we did in our analysis as a, a back of the envelope type calculation. And so that's what's being shown here. The top of the atmosphere radiative forcing as a function of the month, um, the absorbing, uh, the absorptance or absorbing HGM results that I showed before are shown in blue here. And if we had a non-absorbing HGM, the results of that are shown in the yellow. So they would actually reduce the surface albedo and uh, I mean, sorry, they would actually increase the surface albedo and reduce the radiative forcing over Arctic sea ice. And the annual average of that would be minus 4.4 watts per meter square at the top of the atmosphere. But there are some caveats with that. Um, that is if these HGMs 
could be manufactured. I have no idea if non-absorbing HDNs can be produced. And that's also if they could be dispersed without contamination. So they, the manufacturer describes that they tend to break under shearing conditions. So this is certainly a consideration of how these would be applied in a real sense. Um, and yeah, those two things are just open into questions on what could actually be done in terms of their application. Now to look at uh, this in a different way, um, I showed an example before from the al system albedo at the 500 nanometer wavelength. Um, I wanted to revisit that result. So before we had an underlying albedo on the x-axis and that's shown in this black line. And the absorbing HGNs, which is what the 2018 study proposes, the results of that are shown in the red line, showing that the albedo does increase at low reflective surfaces but it decreases for high reflective surfaces. Now, if we revisit this again with non-absorbing HGMs, we find that there's an increase in albedo over all underlying reflectivities. So there is no break-even albedo. This uh, ultimately would have an effect in raising the surface albedo. That is if they can be manufactured. So one question that we had about this is if this could be manufactured and applied to sea ice, what would be the best time to apply it for an annual application? And I forgot to mention these results, the monthly results that I show were for monthly applications of HGMs. In a realistic sense, like you couldn't do that. That would be impossible to spread these out on a monthly basis. So what about a one-time basis each year? When should we do that for the maximum benefit? So the maximum benefit would be for the month of May, and you would only need 360 megatons to cover the Arctic sea ice. Um, and this would result in a decrease in the radiative forcing by 0.18 watts per meter square per gigaton. So that's not an insignificant number, um, but it would require a ton of material to do something like this. And to give you uh, some context of what that number means for the ideas that have been proposed for stratospheric aerosol injection or sulfur injection, rather, this number is between minus 0.2 and minus one watts per meter square per teragram of sulfur injected each year. So that is a huge factor, much larger than this HGM efficiency. Now, these were the sciencey results, but I wanted to bring in the human element of this uh, geoengineering proposal and the experiments that were done. And this is the idea of governance and who has a say, like stakeholders and rights holders, when it comes to applying some of these geoengineering ideas, especially on a local level. And I think uh, this was a really unfortunate case where there wasn't involvement of indigenous communities in this experiment when it was done in their home. And it certainly raised a lot of issues that I think are really good to be talking about now when it comes to geoengineering methods, but this is certainly something that warrants more attention. Another thing I wanna raise kind of gets back to the science and that is the scrutiny of the science itself. So there was a paper published shortly after ours that um, revisited the field at all study by the same group. And they were showing uh, that they have a new material and that the new material is more reflective than the old material. But, uh, you know, looking at this a bit further, it's really unclear what the quality of the measurements are. Um, so I want to walk you through this reflectivity or a reflectivity similar to albedo in a sense as a function of wavelength. And what you'll see is these dashed lines kind of have a dip here, right? And these are the same materials that were measured in the 2018 study where there is no dip along these um, same wavelengths. So already there's something weird going on here. And this left-hand plot is for a dry substance. And in this right-hand plot, they apply water to the substance and measure the reflectivity. And this dip disappears. And water would not disappear, or water cannot raise the albedo at those wavelengths. So already there's some weirdness going on with these new measurements and these new um, proposals of this idea actually being 
useful and working for future applications. And I do think it requires further scrutiny. So, okay, I think this gets me to my conclusions. The big takeaway is our study found that spreading these HGMs on Arctic sea ice doesn't work in terms of increasing its albedo. It actually darkens the surface and would warm the climate and speed sea ice loss. What we specifically found was that the HGMs darken any surface that has an albedo greater than 0.61. And that is actually representative of many common ice types in the Arctic and many common ice types that cover the largest proportion of the Arctic sea ice cover. Uh, the biggest, I, I would say the biggest issue with this approach is what happens in March and June due to the presence of snow. And that's because these HGMs would darken the snow surface and that would enhance the melt. Um, and where or when the HGMs do have a negative radiative forcing, that's usually in months where there's very little sunlight. So it has a pretty small effect, uh, minimal effect when you consider the outsized effect in the early spring season, early to late spring season. So the net result that we found was there's a 3.3 to 3.5 watts per meter square radiative forcing over Arctic over the Arctic Ocean, and that's significant. Um, that little absorption amount, that absorptance of the HGMs of 0.1, is driving this result, and that's significant. Now, for the hypothetical non-absorbing HGMs, again, they would have an effect in reducing the radiative forcing. They would cool the the Arctic by three watts per meter square, but it's still unknown if they can even be manufactured, if they can be dispersed without getting broken. And also, I forgot to mention, getting dispersed by not getting contaminated. The manufacturers uh, describes these HGMs as being absorptive of oil as well. So there's a lot of questions of how this could be practically applied to Arctic sea ice. And then for our one-time application each year, you would need a lot of material. And again, that raises questions of how feasible something like this truly is. Okay, I think that's it. Um, thank you all very much for listening. And if there's time, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Melinda. That was great. Uh, and I see Steve is on the call as well. So thank you very much, Steve, for, for being part of this work. Um, I'll open it up to any questions from the audience. We'll just use raise your hand or drop your questions into the chat bar and I can relay them to Melinda. Maybe I'll start us off with one. Uh, you quickly touched upon ways to disperse these over sea ice. Do any of these papers get at how you could actually disperse these at the scale that would be required? I'm assuming some sort of airborne dispersal method. Yeah, um, the discussion was spraying them from ships. That's been floated as an idea. And uh, Steve might have more insight on this, but that was a big thing that our colleagues latched onto, and we're actually going to study in depth, but I don't think that study went further because the student got a job. Steve, do you have any comments on this? Well, um, no, I don't. Um, the, well, hey, maybe I do, yeah. Um, yeah, if you could send ships across breaking through the ice, uh, then you could spew the um, from a tall stack, the wind would carry them out over a large area. Um, and actually, um, that this difficulty of covering the whole Arctic was recognized by Leslie Fields' group. And they, so they did consider whether they might, um, put them on pretty well, dis disperse them over one area, maybe a coastal area that the, then the currents would carry that ice away and they kept just uh, dispersing in that area, they'd eventually cover a large area of the Arctic without having to move the ships all the way across uh, the Arctic. Um, but uh, regarding the actually the contamination that you pointed out, the the wind would carry these um, these glass bubbles out, but it would be carrying them in the same direction that it's carrying the um, exhaust from the ship's uh, engine. So 
um, the soot from the from the exhaust would be likely to go into the same the same place. And so that's a problem you pointed out about the uh, uh, risk of contamination. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Inga, we'll start with you. You're first on the list there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Melinda. It was very interesting. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, very interesting science and really that conclusion, like this is going to do the complete opposite to what they intended. I think it's a really important point. Um, I also got a bit distracted during your talk, like who are these people and what? <laughs> so it looks like the Arctic Ice Project, um, Leslie Fields now left that and started her own Bright Ice Initiative. And it looks like they're advocating doing this in the Himalayas and other regions as well, much more broadly so it looks like um, this issue hasn't gone away and it might be more global. Um, you mentioned the lack of consultation with Indigenous people and that human element as well um, and I just thought I'd raise the moral hazard issue because I remember Project 911, ICE 911 turning up and I think it was an IGS conference and it just got complete silence because everyone was like it was moral hazard to even talk to these people um, and our climate change group at Otago has been talking about the merchants of doubt book you know and that history of how well-funded people distracted people with maybe science maybe climate change isn't real and scientists spend a lot of time saying yes it's real and i'm worried they're now distracting us with geoengineering right maybe we don't need to stop burning fossil fuels when we all know that's what we have to do because maybe there's a magic technological solution so i just thought i'd get <laughs> get your thoughts on that if someone has actually engaged with the science of geoengineering are we at risk of being distracted from the actual solutions that will work Oh, yeah, that, I'm really glad you raised those points because I, I think these sorts of discussions need to get elevated and get more attention um, across different communities, not just scientists, but indigenous communities and these startup companies. Um, I think there are some really good evaluations being done now, assessments of all these geoengineering ideas to see where they fall in line of uh, the range of feasibility. And then to go from there, what sorts of governance should be put in place to make sure that everyone's at the table involved in these discussions to have input into what directions they should go. And also what sorts of independent basic research should be done to evaluate their feasibility, like what further scrutiny is required. And I think at the end of the day, or at least what's been comforting to me in many of the workshops that the International Arctic Science Committee has been involved in for geoengineering methods is it's not used or referred to as a band-aid or as a solution for global warming. It's more as a method to reduce the negative impacts of global warming while we're ramping down carbon dioxide emissions. Um, I don't know in practice how feasible that is or how to really persuade the public perception of what geoengineering is in terms of, or in its relationship to carbon dioxide emissions. I think there's a lot more groundwork to be done there. But from a higher international level, I guess, in terms of coordination, I think their hearts are in the right place for that. Did that get to your question? I think so, yeah. New Zealand has a messy history with geoengineering. Mm -hmm. So there were some New Zealand scientists who were strongly advocating dumping liquid iron in the ocean originally. Um, and then some of their experiments said actually it wasn't a good idea, but the International Maritime Organization stepped in really quickly and said, we're going to deal with this under pollution regulations, this is pollution, and you cannot do it, right? Um, but I feel like for some of these other geoengineering solutions, those authorities aren't stepping in and saying, you can't fight pollution with pollution, right? No, you can't do this, and regulating it, so... Yeah, but yeah, it's that moral hazard of distracting people and especially the public, but also the scientists, right? We've got other things to do than dealing with every startup company's bright idea. Um, no matter how well-intentioned they are, or maybe they're not well-intentioned. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. There's a balance of regulation and basic science and getting people together to work on this in an independent, objective way. Um, and I do want to refer to a nice thing that I saw um, this dear colleague letter from NSF to look at some of these geoengineering methods more closely with more involvement from a broader community. And I think something like that, seeing the funding agencies give that more time and more funding for scientists to get involved is a good step forward. Thanks, Finga. Uh, Roger, we'll go to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks once again for the talk. That was really fascinating. And I'll just echo that 
the conversation you just had with Inga about the long-term strategic things they really need thinking about. Uh, the one I was thinking about was how long it would actually test these things. Uh, it takes these things to get through to the food chain to us <laughs> if they start you know, dropping through the Arctic ice. But uh, just one particular technical question. I think it was back in about slide 30, you showed the two layer uh, radiated model with with that layer um, mm -hmm. and, and the neat little equation that summarized it. Um, I, w I wonder if uh, internal reflections between those layers play a part in anything. It, it, it's a very similar uh, geometry to problems in seismology where, where we get internal reflections within layers and it produces uh, constructive and destructive interference at, at particular wavelengths, frequencies, whatever's involved. And seeing your picture of the field experiments with a dip in it um, reinforce that. I wonder if you've got any, any thoughts on that. Sure, I'm going to bring Steve into this question. <laughs> Steve, Sorry. do you have thoughts? Because he, no, uh, I'm, I'm really glad that he's here because he's been teaching radiative transfer courses for many years now, and he's really the one that can lend insight to your question. Yeah. And apologies for my ignorance, because I haven't been teaching them, but I've been teaching oh, no, it's, <laughs> it's a great question. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, the, the internal reflections, it's really... Um, I mean, it's scattering. These are multiple scattering media. And so you don't, it's not like a mirror, but yes, we, we take into account all the uh, back and forth reflections between the layer that's above the surface and the surface. And the layer that's above the surface could be a cloud also. And do right. the same thing when we're talking about, um, or when we're evaluating the effects of top of atmosphere versus surface um, under a cloud. Um, we, we don't get the kind of destructive and constructive interference that you're talking about because the these layers are much larger than the wavelength. We're, you know, we're not doing radar, we're doing visible and near-infrared light. So the wavelengths are actually, um, they're even much smaller than the individual particles, let alone the, the, si the size of the layers. So we don't see any of that, those kind of effects that you would see in, um, transmission through thin films where you get um, uh, these interference effects. Now, there was another part of the question that I guess I'd forgotten. I, I was thinking that it, we saw a picture of a field experiment that oh. actually did have a dip in it, and and, and that reinforced yeah. my thinking about these constructive instruments. Yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't a field experiment. That was a measurement in the laboratory. Well, yeah. That, um, um, a, another, but another, Another point about that laboratory measurement: um, when the same the same layers of the same kind of glass was measured um, in this more recent paper, the results uh, I mean they were shown in the figure, but there was no comment made in the paper about how they differed from the results of the 2018 paper. And there was more than a factor of two difference actually in the uh, reflectance. So, um, but no, it, no explanation. They were made by a different method. Um, one was farmed out to a commercial company and one was done in house. So that wasn't discussed. And, um, uh, but I would, and, and there was no measurement of transmission or absorption. So we don't know how for the, for the other type of glass what its uh, absorption would be. However, I would comment that borosilicate glass does, if that if that's being used, various types of borosilicate glass, they all do have some absorption. Okay, I, that's enough for me. And thank you, Steve. I that is borosilicate glass for their new material as well. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you both. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Roger. Uh, Stephen, would you like to uh, ask a question here? Yeah, um, I guess I'm not muted. Thank you very much. I wanted to just express my appreciation to Melinda and Steve for um, stimulating what I think will likely be an interesting conversation and discussion. Uh, I'm Steve Zornitzer with the Arctic Ice Project, and 
I, I, I want to um, say that we've, as a result of the, the paper that um, uh, Melinda and Steve published in 22, uh, we have really embarked upon a very a much more serious and uh, in-depth analysis of our own materials. And I think that was warranted. And so thank you for stimulating that. Um, one thing I'll say is that uh, virtually all the, the conclusions that you drew in your 22 paper were based on the calculation from Leslie Field's original paper, um, where frankly, it was not a very well done study. Uh, I, I'll say in retrospect, and, and folks at AIP, the Arctic Ice Project today, um, really had little to do with that study. Um, it, was a good, it was basically a proof of concept study. Um, and her measurements, uh, as, as Steve Warren mentioned just a, a moment ago, really weren't uh, very accurate. And the deduction of your 2022 paper based on her uh, results um, led to a um, calculation of reflectivity of, I think, 0.61 albedo uh, as a break-even point. Um, we, we have uh, done significant additional optical measurements using diffuse reflecting, reflectance spectroscopy and, and other more sophisticated uh, and direct measurements of the reflectivity of um, a, a hollow glass microsphere that's both K1, which was the original version, which is not a very good microsphere in terms of reflectivity or resilience or anything, but we've used an, another manu currently manufactured product uh, called 25P45, um, manufactured by a company called Putters. And um, the reflectivity of that particular hollow glass microsphere, which we're doing a lot of work with right now, uh, the break even point is 0.87, um, which I think will change almost all of your conclusions from the 22 paper. Um, so I, I would just put that forward. We have submitted a, um, a paper to uh, Earth's Future, which is under review right now, um, which uh, provide some of these data uh, for you. We're, there's another paper as well that's uh, in preparation that will be submitted probably within the next two weeks uh, with a lot more detail on the optical uh, properties of HGMs. Um, so I really appreciate the, the opportunity to have this kind of discussion and I think we'll, we'll engage um, much more in depth once the other papers are, uh, most more recent papers are published. Um, I would agree with, um, you know, Inga's comments and observations and the same with Melinda's. I mean, we, we, the last thing we want to do, first of all, is do any harm. Um, you know, if warming the Arctic were the consequence of putting these, this material on, on ice, um, it, it would be the last thing we'd want to do. Um, also, if the materials proved to be toxic, this would be the last thing we would want to do. Um, we are engaging with partners in Norway right now, and we have been for the past almost two years, um, doing a, a series of very uh, in-depth ecotoxicology studies, working with indigenous species within the food chain of the Arctic Ocean, uh, and doing a number of laboratory studies. None of this is field work at this point, because we think we, we have to demonstrate safety before we can go into the Arctic with a, any kind of a limited field study. Um, but um, a, a couple of these papers have already been published. There's many more that are in preparation or um, uh, in press now that will be published shortly that talk about the uh, toxicological effects of um, uh, the, in particular, the, the potter's material, which we're working with now. And, and by and large, um, we're finding very little evidence of significant toxicity whatsoever. Um, and, you know, we have to ask the question, all of us doing geoengineering work have to ask the question, what's the risk of doing our, or of, of using a methodology, whatever methodology it is, um, versus what's the risk of not doing it? And we know what's happening to the Arctic. I mean, the, the, the whole ecosystem is on the verge of collapsing. Um, uh, The permafrost is melting and is thawing, and uh, infrastructure, human infrastructure, is um, is being lost and uh, is 
in danger of, of collapsing. So, I mean, there, there's a whole lot of risk of not doing anything. Um, and hopefully there's, we're gonna be able to demonstrate that there's much less risk of doing some things, particularly if, it's, if it can be effective. So I, I've spoken more than I, I, I really plan to, uh, but I just wanted to let you know that, you know, we're not trying to do something stupid here. Uh, we're trying to do something that's well considered and um, we'll have su you know, sufficient scientific uh, backing uh, to let people make the decision sometime in the future, policymakers in the future, of whether or not this is a tool that, that could be used um, and deployed at a, lar a larger scale. Um, also, one last comment. It's not necessary, in our view, to blanket the Arctic, which would be a completely unrealistic approach. Um, you know, based on some of our modeling work, um, and some of that has been presented at, AG, at the AGU and is being uh, written, for, written up for publication that will be submitted shortly, um, there are strategic regions in the Arctic uh, that actually can amplify the, um, the growth of ice. And that's, we're looking at those strategic regions. There's, there's a lot more research to be done and modeling and simulation work that needs to be done along with laboratory work. Um, but all in all, I think, you know, from my perspective, the results are promising. Um, they're certainly not the results that, um, that Steve and Melinda uh, concluded based upon, I think, some, some baseline data that were really not very accurate to begin with. So, um, you know, I appreciate your work. I think you've stimulated a great uh, discussion here. Um, and, um, you know, I think I look forward to engaging more on, on this topic. Great, thanks, thank Steve. I, uh, oh yeah, Melinda, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, um, thank you, Steve. I'm really glad that you could attend today's presentation and speak up and I hope that we can engage more closely in the future, we certainly have reached out to the Arctic Ice Project with our results before publication, before submission, and didn't have responses. So we are certainly open to that and having discussions on where our scientific differences are and why those differences arise. I do want to clarify that the um, measurements that we were scrutinizing um, towards the end of my presentation from the 2022 paper, the laboratory experiment, those are the ones that Steve and I have some hesitations on because there are some things in it that do not look realistic and we would like to see more information about how those measurements are being done and also transmittance measurements. Uh, I mentioned before that absorption transmittance really helps us understand what the absorption is of these HGMs and that's a critical piece to understanding their effectiveness for increasing the surface albedo. Um, I do have some other notes related to that 2022 study but given the time I do want to see if Steve has any comments he'd like to add on this. Um, no, I'd just like to say thank you, Stephen, uh, for letting us know that you've submitted a paper to Earth's Future, and uh, we'll, um, neither of us has seen it, so we'll be uh, interested to read it when, uh, um, when you're ready to uh, show it to us. Yeah, thanks. Great. Thanks. Um, I just, Stephen, you brought up a really interesting point there. I think that this idea of not just having to blanket the entire Arctic is a really good point. That because of the prevailing patterns of ice motion, if you can, if you can increase ice survival through the Beaufort Gyre and through the transpolar drift stream, you can sort of have a bigger footprint on the overall Arctic ice pack with a very regional focus. Um, application. So I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, we have time for a, a quick question. Subarna, I'll pass it to you, but I'll ask that it's uh, it's quick. And Stephanie, I see that you have lowered your hand. So are you? Um, I'd still be happy to make a quick comment, um, but I'll try to do so very quickly and pass it over to Subarna. Okay, um, we'll pass over. Oh, yeah, you go. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so um, thanks again, uh, Melinda, for an enlightening talk and a thorough examination of some of the stuff that's being proposed. Um, I also did enjoy seeing some uh, artwork by uh, Yoyoe Kasama in the presentation. Um, so I've started doing some work with Arctic Ice Project recently um, and just wanted to offer um, a, a little bit of additional detail on one of the points that um, Stephen made. Um, he mentioned a sort of revised uh, break-even albedo that had been computed using newly measured optical properties. Um, and so the way that, that we did that was by using the same two-layer model um, that you propose, 
but with an absorptance value that corresponded to uh, what the new measurements suggest. And so in doing so, what we find is that the behavior um, of this low absorptance HDM, as we call it in the manuscript, uh, is far closer to the non-absorbing case that you propose than it is to the original um, material that Leslie had measured and proposed. Um, and so what this means, again, as Steve said, is, is that there's a break-even albedo of around 0.87, which I want to note, you know, corresponds to the brightest surface of any of the varied uh, CI surfaces that are considered. Um, so using these updated optical properties, uh, our work suggests that there's actually no surface type that would be darkened by the application of a suitably low absorptance um, HDM material. Um, and then I also want to note uh, that, you know, some of the, the issues with governance and um, getting free and prior consent from indigenous communities before doing field work um, with some of the recent leadership changes at Arctic Ice Project, um, I mean, I'm comfortable stating that we're committed to making sure that all of those things are done in a proper way and that no field tests proceed without involvement and engagement from Indigenous communities, uh, and that ecotoxicology uh, and environmental acceptability is sufficiently demonstrated both to convince ourselves and the scientific community and regulatory community um, more broadly that what we're doing is okay before any field tests uh, proceed. Uh, and again, as a, as a scientist, um, you know, I, I would never be comfortable uh, deploying at large a methodology that we didn't believe genuinely had promise. Uh, and there's a lot of work still to be done, uh, both on the deployment logistics and lots of technical challenges to address. But we think that uh, it's still a method that shows a lot of promise and should be continued to be investigated. Thank you. I appreciate your input on that. And should we expect to see those results of the radiative properties in this paper that's about to be submitted? Or that is in review now? Um, the, the data itself are not um, in the paper that we've already submitted, but it's in a paper that we refer to in, in what we've submitted. Uh, but the, the paper that uh, has all of the data that will be um, submitted shortly is uh, just, just about completed. It's like in its fourth revision. Uh, so it'll be submitted within the next week or two. So there's Thank a you. full paper that describes the um, data uh, on the optical properties. And then the paper that's been submitted is a commentary in, in response to the 2022 paper. Thank you. Interesting. And Subarna, if we can just, we're a little bit over time, but we'll get you in there, but keep it, keep Thank it a little. You. Quick. Thank you for the opportunity to comment here. I have a simple question. And that is uh, the paper that we are discussing here is, uh, you know, based out of the criticism of the paper of the field detail paper by um, Melinda and Steve. I am curious to know um, the data that you got from Leslie Fields' paper. Uh, where did you get the data from? That's the first question. It's from their figure that they published. So you read those four decimal significant figures from that graph? No, it's not four decimals. Steve, there are four decimals and three decimals reported in your paper. Steve, would you like to comment on this since you transcribed that data? How did you find, because I know we have all talking among scientists here, we know all methods. I'm curious to know how we can do that. Right, so I um, I asked uh, Leslie for the data, but I got no response. So I put the um, the published figure on, um, on an expanding Xerox, then Xeroxed it onto graph paper. This is something I've been doing for 40 years as a way of re reviewing plots in published papers where uh, <sighs> the uh, authors are no longer available. And the width of the curve is um, fairly large, so it's definitely not four significant figures. So I just read it as as close as I could. And we just use um, in the calculations, um, uh, yeah, we, we just used what I read. And so to avoid any so round let we, me we, understand. Did you read it with like, you know, eyes reading the data or you're having some optical recognition? How are you reading the data? 
Well, for one, I, this is a puzzle for me because if I were to review a paper mm -hmm. which says, okay, we have got a data and that is not numbers, that is figures which I'm interpreting and, you know, calling it scientific and then building a whole... Yes. Sorry, Subarna. So, it's very Subarna, I do want to chime in that you can't measure albedo with the equipment that was used to a finer resolution than two decimal points. So your argument doesn't hold for that instance. But thank you for bringing this up. Yeah, I, I'd like to, to keep um, things on track here. Um, if, if you do, Subarna, if you will take our published figure and 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 scan it uh, digitally and do the same thing with uh, with um, the field at all figure and superimpose them, you will see that they agree perfectly, at least to within the well, width. Well, you know, I'm a mathematician. It's hard for me to do that. Thank you for your okay. response. Okay. Um, thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Stephen, for, for this great discussion. Thank you, Stephen, um, for the interesting perspective from the Arctic Ice Project and Stephanie as well. I think that was a really fruitful discussion. And I, I, I personally look forward to reading your papers that, uh, that are in the, the publication process here. So thank you, Melinda, again, for volunteering to give a presentation on this, this really interesting topic. Uh, geoengineering seems to be in the news every few days now. And so I think this, uh, a deeper look at this specific uh, approach focused on sea ice is really, really relevant. Um, so thanks everyone again. Uh, stay tuned to Cryolist and the IGS website for future seminars. Uh, the seminar next week has unfortunately been canceled, but we've got a few more left before we take a break for the summer. So stay tuned and uh, thanks everyone for joining. Have a good day, evening, wherever you may be. Take care. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Dave. Cheers, thank you. Thanks, Melinda.